Animal Farm, Chapter 3. How they toiled and sweated to get the hay in, but their efforts were rewarded for the harvest was an even bigger success than they had hoped. Sometimes the work was hard, the implements had been designed for human beings and not for animals, and it was a great drawback that no animal was able to use any tool that involved standing on his hind legs. But the pigs were so clever that they could think of a way around every difficulty. As for the horses, they knew every inch of the field, and in fact understood the business of mowing and raking far better than Jones and his men had ever done. The pigs did not actually work, but directed and supervised the others. With their superior knowledge, it was natural that they should assume the leadership. Boxer and Clover would harness themselves to the cutter or the horse rake, no bits or reins were needed in these days, of course, and tramp steadily round and round the field with a pig walking behind and calling out, Gee up, comrade! or Whoa back, comrade! as the case might be. And every animal down to the humblest worked at turning the hay and gathering it. Even the ducks and hens toiled to and fro all day in the sun, carrying tiny wisps of hay in their beaks. In the end, they had finished the harvest in two days less time than it had usually taken Jones and his men. Moreover, it was the biggest harvest the farm had ever seen. There was no wastage whatever. The hens and ducks with their sharp eyes had gathered up the very last stalk, and not an animal on the farm had stolen as much as a mouthful. All through the summer, the work of the farm went like clockwork. The animals were as happy as they had never conceived possibly to be. Every mouthful of food was an acute positive pleasure. Now it was truly their own food, produced by themselves and for themselves, not doled out to them by a grudging master. With the worthless, parasitical human beings gone, there was more for everyone to eat. There was more leisure too, inexperienced though the animals were. They met with many difficulties. For instance, later in the year, when they harvested the corn, they had to tread it out in the ancient style and blow away the chaff with their breath, since the farm possessed no threshing machine. But the pigs with their cleverness and Boxer with his tremendous muscles always pulled them through. Boxer was the admiration of everybody. He had been a hard worker even in Jones's time, but now he seemed more like three horses than one. There were days when the entire work of the farm seemed to rest upon his mighty shoulders. From morning to night, he was pushing and pulling, always at the spot where the work was hardest. He had made an arrangement with one of the other cockerels to call him in the mornings half an hour earlier than anyone else, and would put in some volunteer labour at whatever seemed to be the most needed, before the regular's day's work began. His answer to every problem, every setback was, I will work harder, which he had adopted as his personal motto but everyone worked according to his capacity. The hens and ducks, for instance, saved five bushels of corn at the harvest by gathering up the stray grains. Nobody stole, grumbled over his rations. The quarrelling and biting and jealousy which had been normal features of life in the old days had almost disappeared. Nobody shirked, or almost nobody. Molly, it was true, was not good at getting up in the mornings, and had a way of leaving work early on the ground that there was a stone in her hoof. And the behaviour of the cat was somewhat peculiar. It was soon noticed that when there was work to be done, the cat could never be found. She would vanish for hours on end, and then reappear at meal times or in the evening after work was over, as though nothing had happened but she always made such excellent excuses and purred so affectionately that it was impossible not to believe her good intentions. Old Benjamin, the donkey, seemed quite unchanged since the rebellion. He did his work in the same slow, obstinate way as he had done in Jones's time, never shirking and never volunteering for extra work either. About the rebellion and its results, he would express no opinion. When asked whether he was not happier now that Jones was gone, he would say only, Donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey, and the others had to be content with this cryptic answer. On Sundays there was no work. Breakfast was an hour later than usual, and after breakfast there was a ceremony which was observed every week without fail. First came the hoisting of the flag. Snowball had found it in the harness room, an old green tablecloth of Mrs. Jones's, and had painted it on a uh, painted on it a hoof and a horn in white. 
This was a run up the flagstaff in the farmhouse garden every Sunday morning. The flag was green, Snowball explained, to represent the green fields of England. The green fields of England. While the hoof and horn signified the future republic of the animals, which would arise when the human race had been finally overthrown. After the hoisting of the flag, all the animals trooped into the big barn for a general assembly, which was known as the meeting. Here, the work of the coming week was planned out, and resolutions were put forward and debated. It was always the pigs who put forward the resolutions. The other animals understood how to vote, but could never think of any resolutions of their own. Snowball and Napoleon were by far the most active in the debates, but it was noticed that these two were never in agreement. Whatever suggestion either of them made, the other could be counted on to oppose it. Even when it was resolved, a thing no one could object to in itself, to set aside a small paddock behind the orchard as the home of rest for animals who were past their work, there was a stormy debate over the correct retiring age for each class of animal. The meeting always ended with the singing of Beasts of England, and the afternoon was given up to recreation. The pigs had set aside the harness room as a headquarters for themselves. Here in the evenings they studied blacksmithing, carpentering, and other necessary, um, other necessary arts from books which they had brought out of the farmhouse. Snowball busied himself with organising the other animals into what he called animal committees. He was indefatigable at this. He formed an egg production committee for the hens, the clean tails for the cows, the wild comrades re-education committee, the object of this was to tame the rats and the rabbits, the whiter wool movement for the sheep, and various others, besides instituting classes in reading and writing. On the whole, these projects were a failure. The attempt to tame the wild creatures, for instance, broke down almost immediately. They continued to behave very much as before, and when treated with generosity, simply took advantage of it. The cat joined the re-education committee and was very active in it for some days. She was seen one day sitting on a roof and talking to some sparrows who were just out of her reach. She was telling them that all the animals were now comrades and that any sparrow who chose could come and perch on her paw. But the sparrows kept their distance. The reading and writing classes, however, were a great success. By the autumn, almost every animal on the farm was literate in some degree. As for the pigs, they could already read and write perfectly. The dogs learned to read fairly well, but were not interested in reading anything except the Seven Commandments. Muriel, the goat, could read somewhat better than the dogs, and sometimes used to read to the others in the evenings from the scraps of newspaper which she found on the rubbish heap. Benjamin could read as well as any pig, but never exercised his faculty. So far as he knew, he said, there was nothing worth reading. Clover learnt the whole alphabet, but could just not put words together. Boxer could not get beyond the letter D. He would trace out A, B, C, D in the dust with his great hoof, and then would stand staring at the letters with his ears back, sometimes shaking his forelock, trying with all his might to remember what came next, and never succeeding. On several occasions, indeed, he did learn E, F, G, H, but by the time he knew them, it was always discovered that he had forgotten A, B, C and D. Finally, he decided to be content with the first four letters and used to write them out once or twice every day to refresh his memory. Molly refused to learn any but the five letters which spelt her own name. She would form these very neatly out of pieces of twig and then would decorate them with a flower or two and walk around them admiring them. None of the other animals on the farm could get further than the letter A. It was also found that the stupider animals such as the sheep, hens and ducks were unable to learn the seven commandments by heart. After much thought Snowball declared that the seven commandments could in effect be reduced to a single maxim, namely four legs good, two legs bad. This, he said, contained the essential principles of animalism. And I'll pause there just to say, that moment is a really important one, and just hold that in your heads as you go through the book later. Four legs good, two legs bad. Whoever had thoroughly grasped it would be safe from human influences. The birds at first objected, since it seemed to them that they also had two legs, but Snowball proved to them that this was not so. 
A bird's wing, comrades, he said, is an organ of propulsion and is not of manipulation. It should therefore be regarded as a leg. This, the distinguishing mark of man, is the hand, the instrument with which he does all his mischief. The birds did not understand Snowball's long words, but they accepted his explanation, and all the humbler animals set to work to learn the new maxim by heart. Four legs good, two legs bad, was inscribed on the end wall of the barn, above the seven commandments, and in bigger letters. When, uh, when they had got it, uh, one, excuse me. When they had once got it by heart, the sheep developed a great liking for this maxim, and they often lay in the field. They would start bleating, four legs good, two legs bad, four legs good, two legs bad, and keep up for hours on end, never growing tired of it. Napoleon took no interest in Snowball's committees. He said that the education of the young was more important than anything that could be done for those who were already grown up. It happened that Jessie and Bluebell had uh, both whelped soon after the hay harvest, giving birth between them to nine sturdy puppies. As soon as they were weaned, Napoleon took them away from their mothers, saying that he would make himself responsible for their education. He took them up into a loft which could only be reached by a ladder from the harness room and there kept them in such seclusion that the rest of the farm soon forgot their existence. The mystery of where the milk went was soon cleared up. It was mixed every day into the pig's mash. The early apples were now ripening and the grass of the orchard was littered with windfalls. The animals had assumed as a matter of course that these would be shared out equally. One day, however, the order went forth that the windfalls were to be collected and brought into the harness room for the use of the pigs. At this, some of the animals murmured, but it was no use. All the pigs were in full agreement on this point, even Snowball and Napoleon. Squealer was sent to make the necessary explanations to the others. Comrades, he cried, you do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in the spirit of selfishness and privilege. Many of us actually dislike milk and apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole objective in taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, this has been proven by science, comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. The whole management and organisation of this farm depends on us. Day and night we are watching over your welfare. It is for your sake that we drink the milk and eat these apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty? Jones would come back. Yes, Jones would come back. Surely, comrades, cried Squealer, almost pleadingly, skipping from side to side and whisking his tail. Surely there is no one among you who wants to see Jones come back. Now, if there was one thing that the animals were completely certain of, it was that they did not want Jones back. When it was put to them in this light, they had no more to say. The importance of keeping the pigs in good health was all too obvious, so it was agreed without further argument that the milk and windfall apples, and also the main crop of apples when they ripened, should be reserved for the pigs alone. End of chapter 3.